Hi, everyone. Welcome to the ACL Year-Round Mentorship. In today's session, we will address the topic about how to keep up with work in the NLP field. Uh, this is especially important uh, because recently we have more and more like people publish in a faster pace. And then we're very glad to have the three panelists joining us today. Um, we will structure our session in the following way. In the first 15 minutes, uh, each of the panelists will use um, maybe four to five minutes to introduce their background and maybe one to two bullet points or top suggestions on how you usually keep up with the uh, papers in the NMP field. Um, then we will address uh, the audience questions one by one. So uh, I guess by default, let me start with alphabetical order of the family name of the panelists. So we will start with Aparna. Sure, uh, I hope you can see me. So yeah, uh, thank you for inviting me to the panel. Uh, my name is Aparna. I completed my PhD in 2019 uh, from University of Michigan with Radha Mihalshya. Uh, my area of interest is in natural language processing. I worked on demographics and the effect of demographics on nat natural language processing tasks. I'm currently a research scientist at, at the Adobe Research uh, India Lab. My current research interests are in um, language generation and information extraction, specifically in domain-specific text. Uh, legal documents is something that I'm closely looking at currently. Uh, I'm also very much interested in analyzing and mitigating social biases in language and language models. Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much about my work-related things. Uh, in my free time, I also like to play guitar. That's something I'm uh, working on currently. Uh, yeah, thanks. Great. Then we'll pass on to Jonathan. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I started my sort of academic career as a student at the University of Sydney, and then went to the US to study at Berkeley for a PhD and then to Michigan for a postdoc. Uh, and now I'm back at the University of Sydney, but now as a professor, so just started this year. Um, my work, uh, you know, had a while to explore a few different directions in NLP. Uh, historically, things like syntactic parsing, coreference resolution, um, a lot of dialogue work. Uh, these days, the direction I'm taking my group is looking at dialogue for code generation. So things like text to SQL, or generating code that uh, renders plots, just things like matplotlib or other visualization libraries. Um, but, you know, as an academic, you work on all sorts of crazy things. So I also work on things like the board game diplomacy um, and yeah, whatever comes across my desk that seems cool. Um, and I think that's all we're doing for intro. And then in terms of uh, uh, how I manage papers and so on, I suppose we'll, we'll take turns on that next. Sounds good. Thank you. Great. And I'm the last panelist. I'm Eric. I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley entering my fourth year. Um, also work with Dan Klein, just like Jonathan. Um, I work on things around large language models these days and also sort of the intersection of that with uh, sort of like security and privacy and robustness and, and these kind of areas. Um, yeah, I've, I've worked on kind of a diverse set of things during my PhD, so have done a lot of trying to keep up with various literature uh, things over the years. Yeah, um, thanks all for the brief introduction. And I see that a lot of our backgrounds are um, have various overlaps. And also, uh, maybe I can start with some of the questions. As many of us mentioned uh, keywords like bias, language models, um, there's actually a uh, question on Slido specifically asking about, um, there's a student working on analysis for large language models. And then as we know recently, there are a vast amount of papers publishing on this topic, um, LM and also bias. I feel like the publication speed in that subfield is really high. Um, with regard to that, like uh, the question is, what are some good ways to keep track of all the papers that are worth reading? And maybe like how many of the papers do people have to read, let's say for um, early year PhDs to keep track of the things 
each week, each month, um, maybe a rough estimate of the scale. Um, and we can start with anyone who have thoughts. I could start, I guess. Um, part of my big mindset behind reading papers is kind of like a shotgun approach, I guess I would say. I read a lot of papers, but not many of them in depth, I guess. Um, so I kind of see a ton of titles of papers. I see a good amount of abstracts and the number of like section fives of papers I read is, is actually pretty small, I think. Um, and I think that's somewhat necessary. I feel like if you're working on an area like large language models or something in that there's just no way to keep up with all the field uh, that's going on. And at the same time, I try to at least take a look at a lot of stuff because otherwise I kind of get a fear of missing out that I like have missed some super related thing or um, someone has already done what I'm working on right now. So I, I really do try to see a lot of papers, but I don't read that many. I think. Uh, yeah, I can add on to what Eric said. I do read a lot of papers, reading as in just skimming through them. Uh, looking at what exact uh, at a high level, what are they trying to do? Uh, I also I think uh, specific groups, specific research groups across the world, they uh, they are known to focus on biases or language model uh, biases. So uh, I would also follow their works. Anything recently from their groups, uh, that is something that I do. <laughs> uh, and I think attending conferences and. I think that's like a very, um, that's any, all of us do and we just go and anything, any sessions that are specifically on language model biases, that would be like, an, um, just sit through for a two hour session and just keep it, uh, listening. That is anyway there. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty much, I just keyword search in ACL anthology, keep looking. <laughs> yeah, building on both of those, I think I'd add one, refinement of this idea, which is that I think you need to distinguish between the papers that are fundamental to the project you're working on now. So uh, really that connect in a really deep way that you have to put in the related work. Like as soon as you see it, like, oh, that's going to be an important thing. And the papers that are interesting or related or just uh, other parts of the field you're interested in, um, but aren't as uh, absolute critical papers. And Certainly for the, the latter and just getting a sense of the field, everything that's been said so far is I totally agree with. For the ones where you think you're gonna end up citing it for sure in your related work or the thing you're working on now, uh, it's gonna change your direction potentially. Th that's the case when you just set it aside and say, okay, you know, I skimmed the abstract of this one and it, it's now flagged. I need to set aside some time to read it really carefully and closely and then have a separate process for dealing with those. And so I think, thinking about those two categories separately is, is really helpful. And particularly for an area like this, where there's just so much happening. Yeah, thanks a lot for all the suggestions. I see a little bit like about a consequential list of thinking in terms of how each paper con like contribute to the actual action of our research. Uh, in that way, we can prune the space. Um, and I also really like the idea uh, of scanning through a large number of titles um i also feel it's like really pleasant when like just scanning through maybe hundreds of titles and not diving into the, the, them um i feel like just paper titles at each conference are informative enough um great uh so uh now let's get to other uh questions um Maybe a quick question following up that is, in general, what's the time budget of paper reading, um, like on a daily scale or on a weekly scale? And then the paper reading can separate into um, the actual title and uh, uh, maybe quick scanning of section five, as uh, Eric mentioned. We can also separate that into just scanning through the Twitter um what are some example time budget that you distribute on them maybe i'll jump in first on this one and just say that this is something that's going to change a lot over the course of your academic experience certainly for me i had way more time as a phd student to do these things harder that may be to believe um and also uh my impression of the importance of different sources has shifted over time um 
you know, obviously Twitter has grown a lot more active in the last few years or, you know, compared to where it was you know, 12 years ago when I started in the field. Um, I think as and I should say also the amount of time you have will also shift across a year. So I think trying to commit yourself to reading X amount of papers each week or X amount of time or something, uh, that is going to be hard to stick to. Um, but again, trying to find time when you can and you know have a periodic check-in and say, wait, have I been reading enough recently? I'm going to try to devote more time to it. Um, so I don't think there's a simple single answer, um, but certainly I think the more reading you can do that is focused and you know actually contributing to your research, uh, the better. And the catch is they're focused and contributing because I think it's also easy to uh, read papers and not sort of take an action to help you actually use the content. You just read it and then you forget it 10 minutes later. And so, um, yeah, maybe we can dive into that process later. But just in terms of time as a raw number, I think at the peak, the most I've ever spent per week reading papers was probably eight hours a week. And there have been many zero hour weeks. So that's a range for you, for me at least. Yeah, I think for me, it's also a bit bimodal in that in sort of the lead up to like a conference deadline when I'm trying to sort of submit a paper, I'm very much kind of heads down on the paper, not reading much at all, unless it's one of those papers that is like super, super relevant to what I'm doing, in which case I'd probably like drop everything and check it out to make sure I haven't been like scooped or if it's like really, really good to cite that paper or something. Um, but then in like the post-conference deadline or like when I'm trying to look for a new project or just kind of in the sort of steady state of research, I do a lot more reading in those kind of times. And I, I agree also it's maybe like something like 20 to 50% of my time, depending on um, sort of how, how much I want to read at the time. And then in the lead up to conference deadlines, it can be as much as a 0% of my time for like weeks or months on end. I agree with both of them. I guess uh, when you're doing brainstorming, when you're trying to pick up a problem or uh, dig deeper into the problem, we end up reading a lot. Uh, when we're implementing or uh, writing it up, then that reduces. Uh, also, when I was a PhD, I agree that uh, I was probably reading a lot more. Uh, these days, one fine afternoon, I pick up and I end up skimming through, trying to see if uh, there's anything recent that can help me in my current projects. So that's, I agree with that. Great, thanks a lot for the insights. I think these example numbers will be uh, very good for beginners to at least form an, an idea of how this goes. Thanks for being willing to step into this and sharing the numbers. Um, and then we will dive into the two most popular and I think really interesting questions on Slido. I first lay out the questions and we address them one by one. Uh, the first question is, when you see a lot of papers, do you have a system for searching, connecting, going back to the papers that you have skimmed through? I feel like it's also an NLP question about how do we form our knowledge base for efficient retrieval or efficient new reasoning? Um, and the, the data is the papers we read. And then the second question we'll address after this is, uh, how do you distinguish a good quality paper from average? So we start with the first one. How do we grow our uh, knowledge tree of papers? Yeah, I personally don't track anything, which is not good, I don't think. There's many, many times when I get into a situation where I'm like, I can't remember the title or how to search for this paper that I've looked at before. And I like really need to find that paper. And it usually ends up being a situation where I like message people and be like, do you remember this paper that we talked about like a year ago that did this thing? and. Um, so usually it ends up being kind of a mess. I think there are definitely like at one point I tried to keep like a spreadsheet or something of like every paper that I've like looked at and like some keywords that I might be able to search with or something, but um, that ended up not really lasting forever. I guess I kept that up for like a couple of weeks on end. So I do think if there was like a better solution, then I'd definitely be interested in like taking that out. So. Um... My procedure is, uh, rather I should not call it a procedure. It's uh, when I'm uh, fixed on a specific research area. So for instance, if I'm working on biases, uh, I want to do analysis of biases in some uh, 
um, language then i try to so if i have a story in mind or if i'm trying to create a story in mind i try to recite there itself so in a let's say a word document this, uh, this is something i'm trying to work on these are the most recent ones uh, this is a challenge which this paper addressed and um, this is a challenge that none of them address so i try to make up a story uh, if that's possible otherwise uh, just storing them in as a spreadsheet perhaps sure that too the other days i've done that uh, i think i i'm a bit manual in this uh, I, i i'm just seeing one of the chat messages there is a tool which is apparently <laughs> which does something uh, is something i'm looking at but uh, i'm a bit manual i try to write up whatever i come across uh, only the most relevant ones others i just skim through so Um, so I've tried a few different systems over the years. Um, I know some people have used things like Zotero or Mendeley and liked them. I've never really you know, been interested in those. I've also tried the spreadsheet thing and somewhere I still have a spreadsheet with little paper summaries for a bunch. That didn't really stick. Um, I tried a blog for a while. So I had uh, a few months, I know I made 50 plus blog, blog posts, I think, where each one was on a paper. And that worked for a few months and then a bit, really big deadline came and I stopped doing it and I didn't get back to it. Um, right now, the scheme I'm trying and we'll see how it goes is that um, I have these pages on my website called reading notes. And each time I read a paper, uh, whatever I think for me is the most interesting or relevant piece, I update one of those pages with a citation and text. And so it's less an article about a single paper and more just an article it's a page about say semantic parsing and then within that i mentioned papers that you know what i thought was exciting about them um we'll see if that sticks in general i think uh you have to experiment with these different approaches and figure out what works for you um and you know different people have found different ones work um i will say separately though when it comes to a, a new project or, you know, we've got an idea and we're, we're saying, okay, let's dive in and get to work on this. At that point, I'll do the literature search and the, you know, crawl the web of uh, citations and look for keywords and so on. And through that process, come up with papers and read those. And that's kind of its own process. Um, and there it's very much as we're going along, oh, this one we, we should cite or this, you know, this changes what we're gonna do. Um, but for just keeping up with what's, what's appearing at conferences and, uh, on archive and places like that. Yeah, I've tried a few different things and none of them have stuck. Maybe this one will. I'll let you know a year or two from now. Great, thanks a lot for the suggestion. Um, so I do like the note taking uh, type of sharing for, to address this question. Maybe another, like when I stare at the question, maybe another way, like another thing that the, the, the person who asked the question is curious about could be that how do we form the mental space of a paper? Uh, while, while we were going through the previous answers, I come up with a case uh, example. Let's say if there is a paper, like because no one is perfect, let's say there's a paper from a famous lab, but then some researchers are able to distinguish that this is, uh, I don't really believe in this paper. Uh, it, like learn, like have a criti like critical way of understanding the paper. But maybe for beginners in the field, they're more likely not able to detect this and like just uh, follow this paper, take everything as truth. Um, what, what might be some tricks to find out that um, like um, there's actually a different way to understand the problem and what a paper says is not necessarily all correct. I don't know if there's any tricks, I guess I would say. Uh -huh. I think it's more just like a developed sort of like good way of asking hard research questions and seeing whether experimental evaluation is set up correctly. I think like a good way of learning that is through reading groups and other ways where you can read papers with other people and hear their thoughts on things. Because often when I do that, I hear people suggest something like, oh, they've forgotten the baseline like this. And I'm like, mm, that's a really good idea. I didn't think about that. So I think you can learn a lot from like just seeing how your peers react to papers. And there's definitely a lot of papers that I think are like maybe bad where other people think are good and also vice versa. And I think it's interesting to see those kind of disconnects. Yeah, 
so true. Yeah, I, I like the insights. I personally also learned the most from one-to-one learning from more senior members, and they have a mental space of how the landscape of a whole field is like. So yeah, that's really mind blowing sometimes. Uh, great. And then uh, I think this naturally connect to the second most popular question about how we usually distinguish a good quality paper. Um, I guess it could be that maybe from our news feed or archive feed or Twitter feed, there are so many papers. And then one criteria we uh, had mentioned before is that depending on how relevant this is from our paper, we devote the time to read it. Um, and then what the other side of the question is after we read, the, read a paper that is relevant, how do we distinguish like uh, whether it's a good quality paper that we should extensively build our uh, next step research on it, or we should treat it critically and maybe um, even propose a different idea on that. I guess this relates to Eric's previous response, but feel free to suggest if you have extra thoughts on this, like distinguishing. Sorry, I just lost the audio. Um, I also lost it for like a second. Okay, yeah, maybe my oh. internet connection wasn't stable. Uh, I, I guess I was reiterating um, uh, oh. maybe extra thoughts to add on how to distinguish a good quality paper. Yeah, so well, maybe I can jump in with one follow-up thought, which is that I treat every paper I read as I'm reading it slightly skeptically, I think. Uh, even the very, very best papers that have thousands of citations and win awards and so on, you can find things where you say, oh, you know, they should have done this better or the evaluation has this issue. You know, no paper's perfect. So I think you always have to be reading with a critical eye to say what, you know, of the claims they make, which ones do I buy and believe and which ones do I think they haven't quite proven. Um, and at the same time, I think you also have to read generously, you know, to say, you know, what was the most interesting thing they did? What, what did they do that I'm excited about and I will use? Um, and it's relatively rare, like actual academic dishonesty and the like, we're publishing a paper with fake results and that sort of thing. It doesn't happen that much, at least in the NLP field. So I'm less afraid of that and more just trying to see what I can learn from the work. Yeah, thanks for the sharing. Um, and then uh, let's go to the other questions. Uh, one of them is, can yeah, see, there are some more detailed questions such as, can models from benchmarks GitHub websites that are not necessarily tied with a paper, but push the limits of model performance also be considered as state of the art? Yeah, I think definitely, and I think this is an increasingly tricky thing, I guess, in general, which is that, especially on hot areas like language models or diffusion models and things like this, there's a ton of things that are just like Twitter posts, blog posts, random Google collabs you might see, or, or other things like this, which might be actually super relevant to what you're working on. Um, for me specifically, since I've been thinking about a lot of language model stuff these days, there's just a ton of stuff out there that's in non-traditional formats. Um, I don't know what to do from an academic standpoint about those kind of works. Like, do you cite that as like past work? Um, do you just ignore that since it's like not actually a technical publication? Um, and so I think there is some thinking to do as a community of like how to handle these kind of new formats for papers. I think it's all in general good, I think. Um, it definitely, I think, speeds things up. And if you want to just get out some like short, quick idea that you don't think is like worthy of an entire paper. I think posting it on a blog or Twitter or something like that is a good idea. Um, but yeah, it doesn't necessarily help with making, uh, with keeping up with the field easier in anything. It makes it a lot harder when there's just so many, even just like non-archive papers out there that are relevant. Yeah, this is a tricky one, uh, as Eric pointed out. 
because sometimes model performances improve uh, is it like a new research paradigm that's included or is it by extensive hyperparameter tuning uh, what exactly uh, is going behind so yeah do we cite it in research papers generally at least i um, include the place where it's like if it's a it's a blog post then perhaps i'll just include it and note that but uh, do we consider it as state of the art i am not sure i struggle with that question when i'm working so yeah A quick wrap up, I guess it might be good that for people that still code, um, learning from these GitHubs and dive into their source code, see how they structure the neural networks to make it work. Maybe that's cool to learn from. Uh, and for a, a really scientific mention of things, maybe standard papers are more traditional. Uh, but I also respect that the field is uh, moving the medium of expressing. Um, so I guess we'll see how the future goes. Um, then, um, the, let me dive into the other questions. Uh, when you are brainstorming for a new project in an area, what's your strategy for catching up on the literature for that particular topic? I guess this could be maybe a little bit, uh, retrospective looking, let's say when all of us just start to look into LLM or bias or any past area that we get into as a beginner, uh, what was our strategy for maybe the first one week into a new domain or first one month into a new domain? So uh, <clears throat> I would say, you know, Google Scholar is your friend. Obviously the ACL anthology is too. Um, and keyword search is surprisingly effective these days. Um, you know, so just searching for, you know, the terms of the, the topic you're interested in, and then looking at the papers that are most highly cited as a starting point. And then from them, looking at things that they cited, so going backwards and obviously also going forwards. So that's one pathway I use to find relevant work. Um, another is looking at workshops. So if you're getting into a new area, often there is some workshop that's been run you know, once, twice, 10 times, and you can pull that up and find papers that way. And you know, the nature of workshops varies a lot. You know, some are really just little conferences, others are about more speculative topics. But in either case, they'll give you a sense of who is working on that topic in the field. Um, and the invited talks, for example, are often very useful for that to find out you know, which groups are doing stuff. And then from there, you can go look at their pages and see oh, what else have they published. Um, so that kind of workshop pathway. And then the other sort of old school approach is to talk to people. Um, you know, so when you're at a conference in particular, and obviously the timing has to work out, and this is harder in the you know, hybrid or virtual world, but uh, going up to someone who you think works in the area you want to get more engaged in and saying, hey, you know, here's this idea I'm working on or the space I'm interested in, you know, what would you recommend I read? Um, people are generally very, you know, um, sort of willing to share and willing to talk. Um, so it can be intimidating perhaps to approach someone you don't know and uh, maybe as a big name in the field or even just a slightly more senior name, but you know, it's a great strategy as well. Yep, uh, I agree that uh, talking to people who are working on very related areas can really help. I actually did that once and that was helpful. Uh, also, I think uh, what I do, it's again, pretty naive perhaps, but I just, the previous year's works, if there are any in the specific area that I'm interested in or the specific problem I'm interested in, uh, whichever, if, there's, if there are no papers in 2022 on this problem that I'm looking at, then 2021 is one uh, in the backward order. And I just see what's the most recent thing and is it addressing the thing that I'm looking at? Otherwise, what is the most recent work that looks at the similar any similar problem? And if it still has any gaps that I think I could fill, then probably I would dig deeper into that. So yeah, that's something I do. 
Great. Thanks a lot for the set of suggestions. Um, personally, the point that really hit, hit me is when Jonathan mentioned that, oh, uh, look at the keynote speakers at workshops. I never thought about that until uh, several years into research, but that's a really nice pick. Um, great. Um, then we will go through the other questions. Uh, apparently on the slide though, uh, there are a bunch of people interested in more details about how we should look into works about large language models. Uh, one example is in terms of large language models, what are your thoughts on GPT-3? Many papers seem to focus on its applications these days. Where should the research be going? I guess this is asking whether we have an insight about what to expect for the field of large language models, especially because Star ACL recently even have a new track about analysis for large language models. So welcome, any thoughts? I think I have some thoughts here, I think. Um, I think this area is a bit tricky in that things are developing really fast and there's a ton of attention, which can be good, I guess, to think about if you're interested in that kind of area. It can also be a bit negative in that like you don't always want to chase what's hot right now and, and maybe try to find your niche a bit. I think this topic is especially also difficult in that it's a bit industry dominated in terms of actually model training, um, given just like the scale and amount of cost you need to actually build the systems. So it's a bit hard to follow from an academic perspective. And I think a lot of the times papers are on various types of applications because there's not really much else you could do because you can't like modify training and things like that. Um, so naturally you're kind of focused on these kind of analysis questions or downstream use cases questions, um, which I think are totally interesting. And that's what most of my research has focused on these days anyway. Um, but I definitely think it's an area where you should think carefully about sort of where you want to get in and if you want to kind of get into it in the first place as well. Uh, so two thoughts on uh, my recent, uh, whatever, I come, came across GPT-3 in two ways. One is uh, we tried to, I understand the power of such large language models. We tried doing um, some generation work, some uh, where we had very limited data. And I was surprised that, you know, with just as few as 10 examples, it was able to almost uh, generate with very nice quality. I was, I didn't look at it more closely. I was just trying to, uh, one of my interns was just trying to experiment with it. But it was, uh, it's also that something that I haven't personally tried, but just read about it, is that GPT-3 also, like any other large language model, has these biases, uh, because I was looking at biases recently, gender biases or any occupational biases. They, it has, like any other language model, inherited all of them uh, or most of them. So um, before using it, perhaps there are certain limitations for such large language models as well. And looking closely into them would be more interesting, I feel. Uh, yeah. Great. Um, uh, maybe we could also fork the question as so I, I do like the thoughts on um, large language models now, um, like uh, by Eric and Apana, um, especially like Eric points out that it's due to the resource limits so that we see more papers on analysis and application. So there's a causal graph here, not necessarily only like how interesting the error is, but also a lot of other limitations that brings up to the current landscape about what papers uh, are more in quantity. Uh, Maybe in order to like broaden the discussions, um, I wonder if um, Jonathan, in your subfield of interest, uh, do you see a landscape of how how uh, like how different papers are there, and then like what do you feel is the more promising threads um, are, are more promising threads in your subfield, um, and usually how to curate that keen eye on this. Um, so, I mean, I would say, you know, there are lots of people going in lots of directions. Uh, the NLP field is really big these days, so it's hard to say, you know, obviously I'm working in the direction I think is particularly exciting and promising, um, but I don't 
think that's important. That's really a personal opinion, right? I mean, I've, through whatever I've experienced, I've decided this is the thing I want to work on. Um, I would say, uh, when looking at all this different work, you know, it can be overwhelming, you know, seeing all these papers come out and the papers come out from big labs and so on. Um, but there are always niches that people haven't considered and that can be interesting. You know, one example, so, I mean, uh, other Michigan alums or current students would know, uh, there was a student in Rada's group, uh, Charlie Welch, who did a whole line of work on personalization of language models. And uh, it was cool stuff and something that, you know, the really, you know, Google, et cetera, at least they're not publishing on yet if, if they're looking at it. And so it was a twist on, on this idea. And so I think um, he still had to keep up with the work on language models in general, but also the subfield of personalization, which connected into all sorts of other things like author attribution and other things. So, it, you know, once you figure out the direction you wanna go, um, you may find yourself working across several sub communities. And that's just the nature of research today. Um, but uh, that can be more challenging and, you know, but it's also more fun. So you get to see more ideas. That's great. Yeah, I also really love the diversity of the field, um, as you have mentioned. Um, now then uh, we will dive into more questions and I will make a note here that uh, some of the questions are very specific about one uh, in detail opinion for large language models. For this session, we prefer to maybe still focus on broader questions like the general methodology of NLP researchers to keep up with work. So we'll prioritize the problems that are more general in nature. Um, so the next question is, uh, what is the scope of the NLP research in terms of the domains on which the models are developed, such as education and healthcare? Um, I didn't fully understand the question, but if any panelists do understand it, feel free to go so, or if the person well, can. Yeah. I Thanks can me. jump in with maybe a thought, which is, so th there is definitely this, you know, if you look at the NLP ELP field, a lot of the work is either on news text or web text. Um, the web, because you can just download it, uh, well, if you can do so legally, news, because there's just a history of having access to news data. And I think that has, for a long time, the data we can easily get has been what has guided what we work on. Um, not universally, but mostly. Um, now, I think there are lots of people exploring other directions, other sources of data, uh, looking at other resources. You know, uh, David Bannon at Berkeley, for example, has done a lot of work on literature and showing, you know, here's how NLP tools fall down when you try to run them on a book and here's a way to fix it. So, uh, you know, I think take any domain or sort of uh, type of text, genre, you know, however you want to characterize it. And there's probably someone in the field looking at it, uh, whether it's one person or a thousand, uh, you know, that, that'll just vary. And I think uh, really when you're thinking about that, finding a domain that's of interest to you is pretty powerful. And then that can then connect you to other researchers in that space. And again, that can be a way for you to narrow down the scope of what you're looking at a little bit, while keeping in mind that, you know, if you're working on, say, uh, biomedical uh, abstracts and papers, uh, methods that look at other parts of NLP might still be relevant. So you can't get too myopic about the specific domain that you're interested in. Yeah, I think just to add, someone mentioned earlier the diversity of topics that we're working on these days. And I do think there's somewhat of an explosion of different areas of things people are looking at. I think, as Jonathan said, you could name a type of text and someone is probably doing NLP for that uh, domain right now. And I think that's an exciting thing. Um, part of that, I think, is driven by just how much progress we've made on sort of generic core NLP. And, and now things are kind of actually working in a lot of domains. Um, and I think it, it does get tricky when you do work in a specific subdomain of how to keep track of work um, in sort of a completely different domain that actually might be relevant. Great, thanks for the thoughts. Um, I think the diversity is a really good point here as well. Um, and um, 
Now, uh, the next question is, what are some ways to generate hypothesis towards building better NLP models instead of just comparing with the previous models to compare performance? Let me also uh, comprehend yeah. the question. I have a few here. thoughts, I guess, here. I uh -huh. think, I guess, yeah. I would kind of interpret this question as like how to do evaluation for NLP models in these days, I think. Um, and I do think there's a lot of interesting things here. For instance, um, sort of the classic way we've been developing models is this kind of leaderboard chasing uh, method, as the kind of question alludes to, uh, which definitely has its issues in that you can kind of overfit to certain benchmarks where you're kind of climbing and just trying to beat the last person. Um, I think these days people have moved to more, I guess, holistic evaluations, I guess I would call it, where people are evaluating on maybe multiple domains, or maybe they're also evaluating on distribution shift, or maybe also bias and fairness, in addition to accuracy. And so my recommendations would be to try to think a bit more broad than just maybe one data set, um, unless you're really convinced that data set is like super important for the task you're interested in, um, and try to think about maybe evaluating your model on kind of a whole suite of different different things to get like kind of like a more, you know, broad picture of actually what's going on. Uh, yeah, interpreting again, going by Eric's interpretation of evaluation. So I also think that whenever we are trying to develop any NLP model, it's important to keep the target audience who's going to use this in mind. So specifically, like uh, since I've started working on some domain specific text legal documents recently, I've realized that it's not for, is it for lay people who are trying to read legal documents or is it for experts who are trying to interpret them? Based on um, these target audience, the evaluation would be different. Uh, we will go for the lay people to go to understand how good they understand or, uh, with experts. So it also probably is needed to take the target audience into the picture when doing all of this. Great. Uh, thanks all for the suggestions. Uh, I really love how our session goes. Uh, I want to end the session with a question that I created uh, in my mind when listening to all your opinions. Um, so what I digested so far is that it's not the papers we read. It's not only the papers we read that is important. It's about uh, like we digest the papers, form our own thoughts, produce our own good research like this whole chain is uh, important for a researcher. Um, then the question would be like, um, I also want to link this thought with, um, as I saw in Jonathan's recent uh, Twitter about like, uh, we're adjusting the criteria for get uh, selecting best papers and so on. Like maybe I can form the question as, what are the qualities of outstanding best paper, outstanding papers, best paper or good papers you see? And then when we, decode what's happening there, what like what type of brilliant ways do the authors turn what they read into what they do or like stand on the shoulder of giants? It's a broad question and we will serve it as, as conclusion as well. So we can combine our overall thoughts on this session into the answers as well. Maybe I'll go first, connecting on the tweet. So I want to say, Briefly, so this new policy um, does actually have a sentence saying you know, what we think best papers should be. It's hard to say, you know, definitively what is the best paper. And I'm sure if you go to any conference, you, know, you talk to people after the best paper award session, you'll have people saying, oh, that one didn't deserve it. Or, you know, that was the best, best paper I've ever seen. You know, so it, it's hard to say. Uh, there's no formula, I'd say, for here's what you do to get a best paper. I think. Um, you know, when you're doing work and you start to find exciting results and you think, wow, this could really impact the field, then you know you're onto something. Not that, but I haven't, I haven't won a best paper myself, so I also am speaking from a position of ignorance. Um, but uh, I would add, though, on this general question of um, good work and bad work and, and how to keep track of the field and the interesting, valuable stuff that's happening, um, one thing that you know, was just to mention that I think is critical is this idea of synthesis. Uh, so taking what you're reading and somehow uh, synthesizing it into your own thoughts. And you know, we've mentioned lots of different ways of doing this on the uh, you know call already. 
Um, but you know, if you passively read something and just get to the end and then you know set the paper aside or recycle the paper, um, that doesn't have the same value as when you take some effort to synthesize it, connect it to some other, uh, some way of structuring the things you're reading, connect it to work you're doing right now as a summary. You know, in some way, connecting it to other things you're doing um, is very helpful. And one example of that is, is looking at it and saying, oh, wow, this was an example of really great work. Either you know, it could be also, it could be great in one dimension and not others. You know, the methodology was amazing or you know, the idea is great, but they kind of evaluate it in this weird, not so good way. So really uh, being willing to look at the paper and say, here's the bit that I think is awesome. And here's the bit that I think is not so good. That kind of critical and critical, not in the like negative sense, but critical is in just the careful reading, um, is very powerful for your own work with changing what you do and how you do it. But it has to be a, a thoughtful and uh, engaged process. Yeah, I think adding on that, <clears throat> I would say in terms of like good work and best papers and, and this kind of thing, you should keep in mind also that research is very subjective and there's papers that I thought were amazing of my own personal work that I like really, really liked and then got rejected with very bad scores from conferences. And there's also papers I didn't think were that interesting that got amazing scores from conferences. Um, and so I think there's always this thing of uh, everyone's going to have their different tastes. And of course, there's going to be best papers that a lot of people don't like and a lot of papers that people do like. Um, and so I, I do think it's important to kind of carve out your niche and know when the feedback you're getting is good sort of objective feedback on your work and when some feedback you're getting might be more subjective of someone's personal taste. Yeah, uh, I agree with both of them. <laughs> I honestly uh, haven't won a best paper award. So I do think it's subjective. Uh, yeah, I think I agree with both their thoughts. Nothing more to add on that. I want to jump back in briefly. Add one thing: your uh, one change in this policy is also to create a new category of awards. So we will be giving out more awards as a community, which I think is a really important thing to do to recognize lots of good work, um, and so that people people will have that experience of having a uh, an outstanding or best paper. So hopefully, you know, the number of people on this call in the future who can say, yes, you know, I did this work and it won an award will be higher. Great, thanks. Thanks for a lot of opinions. And uh, to the people who are listening to this mentorship session, I do think that curating a taste for what work to keep up with and how to keep up with them is sort of a long experience, like a, a long term process that need experience and critical thinking, a lot of chats with friends. Um, so um, I guess, like also as mentioned, there are a lot of subjective criteria of what is a good paper. So uh, normally, as some practical suggestions, I try to keep up with keynote uh, speech, um, I try to keep up with highly cited papers um, and uh, papers with interesting titles. And then maybe by in the data driven approach, we can self learn uh, and curate our uh, feeling about what's good work and how to keep up with them. Uh, but in general, keep trying and we'll improve in the end. Um, and with this, thank you everyone for uh, attending the ACL mentorship session. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time.